I want to say welcome to the APH Chameleon 20 and introduction and I'm going to turn it over to you Paul. All right, thank you everybody. We are ready to get this started. So let's talk about our agenda. We're going to let you meet our presenters. We'll give you the objectives for the webinar. Uh, we'll let you hear more about the chameleon and the kickoff meeting that really got it going, which was very interesting. We'll see an overview and a demonstration of the chameleon. Uh, we'll hear about feedback and field testing of the device, impressions and plans for the future. We'll wrap it up and please remember to place your questions in the chat, Alt-H, if you need the keystroke. And this, of course, is one and a half hours of CEUs. All right, now our presenters. Andrea Wallace, statewide educational specialist for the visually impaired and, and also involved in the Florida Instructional Materials Center. Next presenter is Stephen Guerra, president slash AT trainer, Guerra Access Technology Training, LLC. Greg Stilson, head of global innovation for APH. Next is Joseph Hodge, software quality assurance analyst, All right, let's get to our three objectives for the day. Identify three ways the Chameleon 20 can be customized to meet the unique needs of students. Review four internal applications built into the Chameleon, which will be used by students in the classroom. And finally, identify three mainstream devices the Chameleon 20 connects to for Braille input and output. All right, so we are going to now turn this over to Andrea, who's going to talk about the kickoff meeting and her and Andrea. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, if you could change the slide for me to the next slide. Awesome. Thank you. So back in May 2019, APH organized a, a group of very passionate professionals um, to sit at the table and talk about the needs for a refreshable Braille display. It was the BR20 kickoff meeting. Um, we had representation from residential school teachers to itinerant teachers, product developers, and consumers there to brainstorm. And APH uh, gave us a blank slate and said, reaching pie in the sky, hence my picture here of a pie chart uh, in floating in the clouds. That's our pie in the sky with some of our wish lists noted on it. Um, we got to brainstorm about what things we'd like to see and what would benefit students most. So they also shared feedback from a survey they sent out to teachers of the visually impaired. And um, I have noted here on this slide just some of the takeaways from the meeting and from that survey. So what we really discussed was that there was a need for a device that allows simple note taking and reading that can happen anywhere and everywhere. And that would provide maximum access to literacy at its core for students, which is reading and writing. It was also important that it was it would be able to be used with mainstream devices and be more robust when needed. So being able to hook it up to a tablet or a computer. It was also important that it would be um, able to facilitate braille learning and learning the braille code and reinforce fluent braille reading with the appropriate amount of cells. It was also important to keep it simple to make sure that it was accessible to all learners who are Braille readers and something that's just not geared toward adults. And Donna McNear really drove that point home. It was really important to her that we looked at something that meets kids where they're at. Um, we just discussed the success of the Braille buzz and how we could make that happen in sort of a refreshable Braille display. Also, personalization came up, which was seemed to be almost the hottest topic at the table. Um, we talked about how, you know, we can personalize our phones, our computers, our laptops. I have stickers all over my laptop saying that, hey, this is mine, this is me, so why not a Braille display? Kids want to be kids, show off their personalities, so 
that's, that's really fun and it makes it more motivating to use when you can decorate it and make it your own. We also discussed apps and educational games that it would be super cool to be able to include those built into a refreshable braille display so our students had access to different types of apps to facilitate learning and to have fun. And also from the survey, a test mode so that students could use their refreshable braille de device that they use every day, um, also on standardized assessments. Um, it was so awesome to be able to be a part of that team and to collaborate on the device and the uh, rest of the APH team is going to show you what the chameleon can do and how they really made it a focus for children. So um, going back to my pie in the sky image, we really looked at, you know, Wi-Fi, color, having a clock, being able to read and edit on the device and all kinds of apps. And that's all I got, Paul. All right, thank you. So now we're going to turn it over to Greg to talk about the chameleon. Go ahead, Greg. Awesome. Uh, why don't you jump to the next slide there, Paul, and we can show the picture of the, there you go. So this was awesome to be, um, and, and I, I wasn't unfortunately with APH at the time when this, when this went on, but hearing the stories of, of um, how these meetings went and, and the amount of feedback that we got from the TVIs and professionals in the field was just amazing, right? And so that's really how APH works is we want to make sure that, and, and as I look forward to, to the part of, you know, innovating and, and how we're going to create innovative products, it all surrounds the problem, right? How are we going to solve the problem? And that's really why we brought Andrea and the rest of the, the group in is to identify what the problems were and what product was going to, to adequately solve them in the classroom. And um, if you want to jump, I'll start kind of showing, showing the, uh, the, the shape and the design of what we ended up coming up right with. before so, you do that i'm just going to let people know that on the screen was just three images of uh, the chameleon with three different colored covers okay you can go on now oh thank you so why don't you jump to the next slide paul and what we what we showcased was the chameleon uh in in three cases and i'll talk about those in a second but what you're looking at right now is the the thumb keys and that was one of the things that we we heard from the professionals the students there has to be an easy way to pan the braille display to move the braille display forward and back they're the most common keys that you're going to press when you're using a uh, uh when you're using a refreshable braille device and with that the student, it needs to be intuitive on how they move back and forth. And so um, the thumb keys, when we looked at what, what products were successful and we looked at the ways that the, the cells are panning and things like that, thumb keys uh, seem to really involve the least amount of, I would say, um, movement, right? It would, they, the, you, you didn't have to move Paul, your- I need to interrupt you, Paul. You need to um, plug in your- Laptop device because we had a warning that your battery is hey, running low. See that. I'm looking for a charger. Okay, sorry, Greg. You are good. Uh, so what we're gonna do? All right. Okay, there you're back me. again. There. Bear with, bear with me one second. Um, okay, so the reason the thumb keys were so valuable is that we were able to essentially ensure that students are able to pan forward and back without really any wasted range of motion. And that's the, that's the essential part of it, is making sure that the students are able to, to move the, the device back and forth. And I apologize, this is the beauty of working from home, but I've got uh, a dog scratching that is completely interrupting everything. Uh, all right, so working from home, fun time's over. Uh, Go ahead and move to the next slide, Paul, once you find your charger. One <laughs> Put this in at the same time. All right. There we uh, go. I don't know it didn't move it forward. Um, what you can do is if you want to let go, I can take over slideshow for a little while. Paul, if you want to jump to the Zoom meeting. There you go. You got it. Okay. And I'll pop on and share. That and I'm just going to move over to the slide. Sorry to make people who see a little crazy with side, slides. Okay. I'm viewing the right slide now. Okay. So if we look at the, the, the various, actually, why don't you jump to the next one? Mm, view back. 
You got it. Okay. So on the back side of the device, one of the other pieces of the, the edges of the device is that we wanted to make sure there's enough removable storage to make the device useful for both internal and external uh, usage. So when we look at that, we need to make sure that there's additional ports and storage medias that we can use to ensure that the student can get files to and from the device, make sure that the content that's on the device um, is useful when you actually take it to, say, your main, your primary device, like a, a phone or a laptop or an iPad, to do really solid content creation, right? So uh, what you see on the back is the SD card slot. There's a, an SD card that takes up to 64 gigabytes of storage. And keep in mind, most of this is going to be straight up uh, documents, right? So you, you have documents like uh, text files, Word documents, books, things like that, that are relatively small files. So you can really put a ton of these files on, uh, on an SD card. Um, and then on the left side, you have your USB thumb drive port as well. So um, you can put in a traditional USB thumb drive that can have significant data on it, uh, amounts of storage. And, and put those files in there as well. So uh, if you want to jump to the next slide, Leanne. Yep. So why did we build it? Um, and this is really a direct result of the meetings that we had with Andrea and the folks that we brought in. Um, they told us what, what the problems were that we needed to solve. Um, and from there, what we looked at was really the, the need of a student's deck desk in, in many cases, right? So if you look at the way that a, a sighted student, what are the main things that a sighted student has on their desk? They have their notebook with a pen and paper. They've got a, usually a watch or a clock that they can tell time. They have a basic calculator so they can do calculations and they often have textbooks along with their homework notebook or file folders, right? And that's really when we looked at the essential pieces that needed to be solved in the internal applications, we wanted to make sure that um, a device like this, at its bare minimum, at the core, solved those problems, right? It, it served that purpose for the blind student, right? And at this point, you know, there's, there's a lot of advanced tools out there. There's a lot of advanced devices that are much more expensive, that have more power and things like that. We weren't trying to duplicate all those tools, right? Those tools are, those tools are there for a reason. But the, the, the primary piece was that we wanted to make sure that the the essential pieces of a student's desk were covered by this device by itself, but that it served as really this awesome bridge to connect to the primary, the main, main devices that they're going to use, which are the, your, your computer, your tablets, and your, your smartphones. So that standalone and intelligence and connectivity were, were really the primary, um, primary focus that we wanted to focus on. The other thing that we heard was that the, from the, the field was when we launched the Braille Trail Reader last year, um, there was this, I mean, it, first off, it got snapped up really fast by, by teachers. We sold out of them extremely fast. It showed us that there was this huge hunger for refreshable Braille in the field, that students needed it. And we heard that from that focus group as well, that, that without refreshable Braille and without having Braille from APH, um, Braille literacy can suffer as well. And we, we, we want to make sure that, that we have choice, that we had um, different options for the, the students with refreshable Braille and, uh, and ensuring that, that it was available from APH on quota. Um, as, as Andrea mentioned, I think the, the overarching theme of that was that um, student wanted, students wanted to customize their devices. They wanted to be able to make them their own in the same way that my wife has probably five different skins for her phone or cases for her phone so she can bling it out however she wants. Um, blind students wanted the same thing. Students with visual impairments want to be able to have their own personality showing on their devices, right? And traditionally, blind students, I, I'm, I'm blind myself. I know, you know Stephen and, and Joe and Paul are as well here. Um, you know, it, it, we use these devices on a daily basis. And, and unfortunately, a lot of the devices that we, we use are plain black devices that have really very little personality when a sighted person looks at them. Um, and so students have the ability with this device to customize it with three different colored cases along with a teal protective case to really uh, enable them to, to say, maybe today I'm a pomegranate. I feel like a pomegranate. Today, tomorrow I feel I have more purple, right? Then I'm the next day I'm teal. So they can swap the cases out in the same fashion that you can swap out your 
uh, your 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 own phone case in, in that capacity. And lastly, I don't think I put it on the slide, but it does also come with some stickers so that if they want to put some stickers, as Andrea says, she's got stickers all over her laptop and things, you know, a student can can do that as well with their, their device. There's some bug stickers and things like that that are just fun that they can, can customize it as well. And, and those bug stickers are tactile. Yes, they are. You're right. You got it. So, so let's move to the what's in the box slide if we can. So what comes in the box? As I mentioned, you get obviously the Chameleon 20. You get a USB-C charging cable. And that's something that is really uh, important because the USB-C charging cable is reversible, meaning that students can't put it in the wrong way. Uh, I can't tell you the number of times when I, in prior, my, you know, my prior organizations and companies I've worked at, we've developed products. And back then, you, micro USB was the standard. Unfortunately, micro USB, you can put it in upside down and uh, the prongs can get bent if the student forces it in, things like that. USB-C is beautiful because it goes in both ways. Um, it does work with any USB charger that you plug into the wall. However, the charger that comes in the box is the optimal charger. It'll charge it the fastest. If you plug it into, say, an iPhone charger or something like that, it may go a little bit slower. As I mentioned, it has the teal, purple, and pomegranate cases in it, along with a teal protective case. And the tactile sticker set, the user guide, uh, which was really important, it is available right now on our website, obviously, but it also comes on the device. Uh, and I'll go through that main menu here shortly to talk you through that. Uh, you can jump to the next slide. So let's talk a little bit about the pricing. This is the other main focus is we wanted to make sure that a device like this was not super cost prohibitive. Now it is available on quota. We're really excited about that. Um, the price on quota is, I think for a 20 cell display is, is extremely competitive. It's something that we wanted to make sure that um, it allowed your quota dollars to go further. Um, so on quota, it's 1295 for a 20 cell refreshable braille device with intelligence. Um, and uh, it is available for cash purchase as well for 1595. So we do have two different prices for that. I'm super excited to say that it is shipping yesterday. So, um, and actually I believe uh, we've already sold out of them. So they will be coming. We have another shipment coming, uh, I believe tomorrow. So um, the cool thing about the, uh, the, the new website is that you can also place pre-orders and back orders. So um, don't hesitate to put your order in. Like I said, we're getting uh, a new shipment, I believe, coming in tomorrow. So um, even though the website says it's back ordered, uh, it won't be for very long. So don't hesitate to put in your orders uh, today. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the internal intelligence. And this is something that we, we got a lot of feedback on from the students and professionals in the way that the menu structure is laid out of. Um, so one of the things that you know, Braille devices often have is a very linear structure. And we wanted to make sure we replicated that with the chameleon, right? So very linear, very tree kind of menu, submenu structure uh, has traditionally been really successful with devices like this. Um, so what we, we look at is when you look at the, the device itself, um, you have uh, what we call the home menu, or many people call the main menu of the device. And you, starting at the top, you have the list of applications that you're going to, you're going to run into. So you have the editor, which is your basic note taker. You're going to have the Braille terminal, which is how you connect to multiple devices. And we'll, we'll turn that over to Joe uh, here very shortly to, to walk you through an actual demonstration of the device connecting. Um, the Braille terminal can connect to up to five Bluetooth devices as one, at once. So if you want to use your computer, I often have the device connected to my computer and my iPhone so that if I'm writing an email on the computer and somebody texts me, I can just with a couple keystrokes switch over to my iPhone, respond to that text message, read it in Braille, and then, and then switch back over to my computer. You have the library application. So as, as, um, as Andrea mentioned, one of the requirements of this device was that it had Wi-Fi. Um, we don't want to just be able to read books when you're connected to a phone or to a computer, but by itself, right? And that's, that's really important because oftentimes it's, it's super beneficial to be able to just have the device working um, without needing to, to be connected to anything else, right? So you can connect to uh, personal Wi-Fi networks and be able to 
Uh, and when I say personal Wi-Fi networks, I mean, you're not going to connect to public networks. So it doesn't have a web browser inside of it. So if you are connecting to, say, a hotel Wi-Fi or if your school Wi-Fi requires that the student types in their, their user ID or something like that, um, you may need to work with your IT department to get a different connection. I know that oftentimes schools uh, do have personal networks or, or staff networks that they allow their student to connect to to download books and things like that. Remember, this device has no internet browser at all, so the student's capacity to do anything uh, negligent or, or bad is 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 going to be uh, very, very limited. They don't have a, outside of the ability to download from Bookshare or NFB Newsline. Uh, they, they don't really have a lot of other options on this device. Uh, so as I said, it has a, 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 a library application so you can dig, go and download your books from Bookshare. Uh, you have the file manager, and this was something that was really crucial, right? It, it, that's a core skill that students need to develop is organization, right? Students who are cited often have their assignment notebooks, they have their file folders that they put their, their worksheets in and things like that. And we wanted to make sure that the blind student or the student who's using this device has the same uh, tools to start developing those skills as well. At the same time, they're also developing file management electronic skills. They're understanding the ways that files and folders are nested together. So you can create, you know, you have drives and you have folders and you have files and getting that, that core um, understanding is crucial because throughout the rest of their, their careers or their, you know, when they, when they get closer to, to employment, they're gonna have to understand how uh, computer systems are laid out and how, how files and folders are, are coordinated together, right? So file manager, they can move around files, copying, pasting, creating folders, things like that in the device. Remember, this is all on the device itself, not connected to any other tools. There's that basic calculator that allows them to do, you know, your basic, uh, I would say four function calculations, plus minus divided by uh, multiplication, things like that. It does have a date and time checker, so they can check their time in class. You have your settings. Uh, online services allows them to make the the sign to to use their um, to sign into things like Bookshare and NFB Newsline. And then the last thing is making sure that the user guide was right there on the main menu. And the cool thing that Joe will show you is that everything that you use from any menu, regardless of whether it's the main menu or any sub menus is all access, accessible through first letter navigation. That's something as, as a blind person myself, um, you know, our assistive technology that we use, whether it's these devices or screen readers, um, first letter navigation allows you to kind of jump over a lot of the stuff that sighted people are able to filter out, filter out right? So if you're looking at your desktop and you wanna jump to um, your, your um, let's say Office 365 folder, right? If you press the letter O, you know, it'll only jump to the items that start with the letter O, allowing you to quickly jump over all the unnecessary ones that you're not looking for. And the same thing works with, uh, with, with this device. The Chameleon allows you to jump by first letter navigation to, um, to, those, to those different, um, th different options. What I'm going to do here before I turn it over to Joe, uh, if it's all right with you, Joe, I, I don't want to take your thunder. If you were, if you were planning on doing it, I'll, I'll uh, turn it over now. But I was going to, using my camera, just kind of show the device in, it, in its full entirety. Is that all right? Yeah, go ahead. That's fine. Uh, all right, perfect. So, and I've got two questions for you, Greg, really fast. Yeah. Well, I'm The first one I want to clarify. You, it is definitely a basic calculator, not a scientific calculator. Absolutely. Yep. Okay, Correct. it is a you're basic not do, calculator. You're not going to do graphing functions or, you know, logarithms okay. and stuff like that. Yep, exactly. Okay. And it was said quickly, I want to clarify. So this means a student could read a book on one device and take notes on another and toggle back and forth easily and quickly. That's correct. Or okay. you can even be super fancy and read your book on this device and then switch over to your editor application and take notes right on this device. So uh, because it has Bookshare connectivity internally, you can use your Bookshare book, read your Bookshare book in Braille directly on this device, and you can uh, switch over to your editor and take your notes right on that book as well. So it's however you want to do it. If you're using a, a book like VoiceStream or a, a tool like VoiceStream Reader or something like that on your iPhone, and that's how you read your Bookshare books, you can do that on your iPhone. Uh, and then I'll walk through some of the buttons that are available. You can switch over to your Chameleon and take notes on that device as well. So it's however you want to do it, really. Are you sharing, do you need to share a different, uh, share your computer? 
or do I need, do you need me to stop sharing? There we go. Got it. All right. Perfect. I am going to stop sharing so they see that large. Okay. All right. So let me switch over to, so that I'm able to ensure that I'm, all right. So what you're seeing here is the face of the device. So the device has your traditional uh, eight, eight dots braille entry keyboard. Um, it's designed for smaller hands, but it also, I, I, I mean, I don't have huge hands, but it is super comfortable to type on. I'll also mention that it's super quiet. Um, this device does not have click clacky click keys. It's really quiet when you type on it. Um, down below, you have your 20 refreshable braille cells. These are the piezo electric cells. You, the very traditional um, cells is not using any new technology. These are the, the tried and true uh, refreshable braille cells that are used in virtually every other of your, your, your classic um, refreshable braille devices. Above it, you have 20 cursor router keys. We are super passionate here at APH about cursor router keys because it allows you to do that on the fly editing. If I'm reading, um, if I'm reading a, a, a document and I find a mistake, all I need to do is raise my finger up, tap the cursor router key, and my cursor would go right to that cell. It's very similar to the way that a sighted person in a Microsoft Word document is reading along. They point and click, and their cursor moves directly to that location. So uh, cursor router keys, below that, there are two space bars. They do the exact same thing, uh, no difference. It's just a matter of whether you're, you like using your right thumb or your left thumb. If I turn it, and Leanne, let me know if I'm not, if I'm too close or too far You're away. Too close at the moment. All right, we're gonna move it up. Sorry, this is uh, we're on the. I'm gonna move to this side actually, and let me know if you can see that at all. Mm, it's out of frame. Out of frame. And you're gonna have to pull up just a hair. All right. There we. Whoop! Almost. Sorry. That's okay. I know. Hey, camera, and can't we see the picture. Doing, I get welcome, it. Welcome to. COVID time demos, folks. This is, uh, you're learning with us. This is, this is good times. Um, you're going to have to pull the camera way up for us that, to see that. It's not, not as easy as I thought. I know. All the right. cameras give us some, there you go. Perfect. Don't move. Okay. Uh -huh. Don't move, Greg. So on this side, you have a headphone jack, a volume up and a volume down. And those are not active right now. We are finalizing some licensing agreements, um, but it is our hope that by the end of the year, we're gonna have text-to-speech on this device as well. So right now there is no speech. Um, for those of you who participated in the Mantis, um, Mantis uh, webinars in the past, very similar to Mantis where you have um, only Braille, uh, but it is our expectation that by the end of the year, we should have text to speech on this as well. So not only can your student listen to or read the books in Braille, but they're gonna actually be able to listen to them for that sort of multimodal experience as well. Uh, in the front of the device, you Perfect. have your, your thumb keys. So you have your, uh, your up, left, down, and right thumb keys. Basically what that does is you pan your, or sorry, up, left, right, and down. That's and so I'm just going to describe that for those people mm -hmm. that can't see. Sure. He went from left to right across that bottom edge, left, right, then there's a center round button, and then two further um, rectangular shaped buttons. I, so you I can think you my play favorite, those buttons again for me? My, my favorite part of working with with Leanne is that she checks the blind guy's accessibility. <laughs> like this is something that I should have ingrained in my presentation, and yet COVID's it's the teacher in me. I can't get it I out. I love it. It's fantastic. Starting from left to right. Come on, Greg, get with the program here. All right. Starting from left to right. And there's actually little tactile markers. Um, at the top of this key on the left, far left side is a little tactile line at the top. That represents that this is the up um, option. So that would take you sort of a line or a sentence up uh, on your Braille display. Moving to the next key to the on the left side of the, the, the front of the device is the uh, pan left button and that has a little line on the left edge of the key to show you that that's the pan left. In the center is that circular key which is the home button. What that does is it will no matter where you are on the device it will always take you to the home menu of that device, so that main menu that we talked about. And it also is the tool that takes you if you're connected to an extra, an, a, a different device like an iPad or a computer or something like that, it'll take you from controlling that device back into the internal intelligence of this device. So when, let's say when you're 
switching from an iPad or a computer and you want to get back to taking notes on this device, you tap this, the center circular button, and it will take you back into the internal applications of the, of the chameleon. The, to the right of that device, or sorry, that, that circular button is the pan right button with a little line on the right edge of the key. And then all the way to the right, the, the last thumb key on this device is the down thumb key that has a little line at the bottom that'll typically take you a line or a sentence down or a, uh, an item down in a list. And then moving to the left side, Leanne, let me check my visual. Yeah, here. if you can move slightly to the left. Nope, that's right. A little bit further. A little bit, stop. We got it, all right. Yeah. On the left side, of the device, you have your USB-C charging port, you have your power button, and then you have your USB-A, your, your, your traditional USB thumb drive port. And it um, looks like between the power uh, charger button and the on-off button, there looks like a little icon for a light, possibly. It is. You got it. Yep. So as a TVI, uh, if you're sighted, you are able to see when the device is, is on or charging. On the back of the device, you just have your traditional uh, you know, rubber feet to stop it from moving around. This battery is removable. Um, so there's two screws here that are very simple to remove. Uh, so down the road, if you do, if your battery is not holding a charge or anything like that, you can pop that off and replace the battery. That's the chameleon in a nutshell. I'm going to turn it over to Joe to do many more better demonstrations than what I'm doing. Uh, and he's going to show you how it actually connects uh, to various devices and things like that. So I'll, I'll switch over to Joe and, and Joe can wow you with all the software functionality. Hello, everyone. Uh, you did great. You did good, Greg. I, I, uh, I got it. So uh, <laughs> what we're going to do is uh, we're going to do a, a quick little demo here of using the chameleon with a computer and an iPhone. So one of the, Greg kind of touched on it briefly there. One of the nice things about this display being uh, blind myself, I use it with multiple devices. So as we all sort of get into this technical world, we're using more and more devices. On a daily basis, oh my gosh, I, I use pretty much every operating system these days. So um, what's really fun is being able to switch in between my devices very fast and quickly. So I'm gonna, uh, I got my chameleon here on the left-hand side of my computer. So I am going to, I'm at the editor. So as Greg mentioned, you can do first letter navigation. So I'm gonna hit T for terminal. I'm gonna press enter. Now what's great is I'm using Bluetooth uh, to connect to my devices. So I have right now on my Bluetooth connections, uh, I have my computer, my iPhone and iPad. For this demo, we're only gonna be worried about the computer and the iPhone. So I'm gonna press enter on my Bluetooth and I see my computer name. So I'm gonna press enter again. And I'm using JAWS. So I'm gonna actually start to, I'm gonna share my screen here. And while he's sharing your screen, just so you know, I'm going to turn off the chat because we're going to hear JAWS. So if you end up having questions, please kind of hold on to them and we'll let you know when the chat is open again. Sorry, I got my speech real slow and uh, oh my gosh, getting it to say share screen was uh, very long. So anyway, <laughs> it was at the very end where it said screen. And I was like, okay, that's what I want. Okay. Uh, so what we're going to do here is on my- You're not yet sharing your screen yet though. I didn't, let's see. Hold on one second. There, there you go. Yeah, there there button go. to activate okay. press space bar. Search box edit, so, type text, computer braille. On my braille display here, I have JAWS actually last said computer braille, so that's what it's showing right now. So I'm going to go ahead and type in Word for Microsoft Word. Word, Word, Word app, press right. Press enter. List box, Word, new list box, blank document. And press enter. So now we're in a document. So I'm going so to pause you for a minute, Joe. Answer yep. a question. Did you type Word in your device or on your computer keyboard? That I actually typed on my keyboard, but now okay. I'm going to go over and start typing in Braille. So uh, what's, what's nice about this is I used to work um, in a call center. And so I'm kind of familiar with the setup I have right now where I have my device on the left-hand side and my computer in front of me. So now I have the cursor uh, with JAWS. Uh, it's, it's actually blinking up and down. So that tells me I'm ready to type. So I'm just gonna say, hi. And JAWS is not going to say anything because I have my typing off. So I wrote, uh, hi, my name is Joe. And I'm going to put two E's there. So I have a misspelling. So as I go back over and read it, uh, I can see that, I, oh, I 
put to ease. I can actually move my cursor on the Braille display itself and I can delete with dot seven here, one of those E's. So I have actually read what I wrote, realized I made a typo and deleted it all on the Braille display. Um, so then you can also review what I wrote here. Hold on, sorry. <laughs> Charles is- uh, Period, blank. Hi, my name is Joe. So I was able to review what I wrote and then I can go to the end of the screen using these cursor routing keys above the Braille and I can move my cursor anywhere I want. So- How did you review what you wrote? I was able to hit Hi, my name dot is Joe. one with space to go to the top of the line. Blank. And then dot four with space goes down a line. Hi, my name is Joe. Blank. So there we go. What's really nice is let's say in this world, I'm doing a school assignment or I'm doing work from home and someone needs to get a hold of me. So Greg sends me a text message. Maybe he wants to brag about his brewers beating my cubs. So what I would do in this instance is if I press the home key on my, so my iPhone's gonna talk here on my mic. I'm just gonna go ahead and- 12, 11 p.m. So it, it came on, I heard it. Now I wanna see what's going on. So if I hit the home key on my braille display, I go back to my Bluetooth connections and I can hit the thumb key and go to my iPhone. It actually just locked again, but that's okay. So I press enter, it says braille display. I press the cursor routing key, it'll actually wake up the well, device. Try again. And it, it, of course, didn't recognize my face ID there. But it actually woke up the iPhone. So if I hit the thumb key here. There are four July thumb keys. 16. Which thumb key are you hitting? I am hitting the, out, the outer two. So the, the, I'm actually right now hitting the one on the right-hand side with the dot on the bottom. So as Greg was kind of indicating, that's going to take you from uh, element to element on the iPhone uh, or sentence to sentence if you're reviewing. So. Um, Thursday, July and 16. Now, let's just pretend I read the text message. I'm going to hit the home key. That takes me back to my Bluetooth connections. And then I can see my computer. And now if I hit dot one. Hi, my name is Joe. I've, I'm now back in my document. So that kind of shows you how fast you can go in between devices and get work done and be productive. So if I'm blank, now I can start typing. D. Hey. I wrote, I just went. Hi, my name is Joe. And now I'm happy to be here today. So as you could tell, that device switching is so simple. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually, and I'm doing this all by Bluetooth. So I, I'm going to actually hold up my Braille display here. I don't know, Leanne, can you see that on my camera? Yes, I, I can. can. Yep. So now we, we have no cables. I'm doing this all within Bluetooth on both of my devices, just to kind of indicate, I just think how cool it is. Cause uh, with COVID, I was telling Greg, I've been lazy. I, I go over to my lazy boy and start reading a book or I can, you know, actually manipulate my devices away from my devices. So <laughs> it's, it's great stuff. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit the home key here and I'm gonna stop sharing my computer sound and I'm Meeting gonna controls do some things to move on to iOS to Stop share all plus S button to activate there. press new books. And just a reminder to everybody that home key is that round little button in the front of the device. When he keeps talking about going to a home key. Yep. All right. Screen mirroring. Screen in Screen mirroring. Heading. Screen in In Screen. In Screen. Screen mirroring. Heading. Screen mirror. Screen. Screen. Screen mirroring. Screen All these fun technology glitches here. Screen <laughs> they are. <laughs> Let's see if I can button. try one more time here. You'll get it. I know you will. Screen in progress. Screen, screen in, in progress. Zoom just adds an extra layer to uh, the technology and being able to display both JAWS, devices, and then how it interacts with the software. So we recognize that Zoom in and of itself has its own limitations. There you go. It's currently unmuted. Alt plus A button to activate press space bar. Stop share. Alt plus S button to activate press space bar. 
voiceover on. Let's try this again here. Voiceover on. Twelve fifty. All right. Do not well, voiceover is not going to come through. I, I, I wish I could get it. For some reason, it's not wanting to come through. I actually hear your sound, so you but don't see it. your screen. Oh, you can't. Good. All but right. I can't well, see your screen. You can't see my screen. Five. It okay. says you shared it, but I can't see it. Two. Let me unlock my Seven. screen here and just see if. Messages. No. <laughs> messages. That's weird. Um, okay. Double chat to open. I'll just improvise. <laughs> so, I'm, what we're going to do here is um, I'm going to just. Uh, so, I'm on my Bluetooth connections here. And if you'll stop sharing your screen, we are really seeing nothing. Okay. Yeah. Let's just do that. Search box edit. Type meeting controls to move to it. There you go. At least we'll see you. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so I got Hi, my Jeff. iPhone here and I'm gonna hold it up and I'm gonna hit the thumb key on the right hand side. Phone. Twenty five new items. So there's there's my phone. Face three and I'm I'm basically navigating phone. the home screen of my applications here. So I wanna go to mail, so which is in my productivity folder. So I go to productivity and I hit the cursor rounding key above the P and I'm gonna hit the right thumb key to go to mail, which it just said mail. So I'm going to hit the cursor rounding key above that and it opens. And now we got mailboxes. So what we could do here is I can, I can actually go through and read my mail or if I wanna compose a message, uh, I can go to compose at the very bottom of the screen and I just use my finger to do that or you can hit four five six with space to go down to the bottom two, text field. and now I'm Is actually it? in my two start. so now I'm going to send Greg an email the G -R. so I typed in GR that pulls him Message up on my body. list Sub and two. I can actually text choose field. his name here Is editing. and mode. now I'm actually going Insertion to be able to type him a message Greg still G message body. So I'm going to send end of text there we go. insertion point at start. And I'm just going to say hi. Because <laughs> we don't have, it's R. kind of hard to hold my phone up here and, and do braille at the same I. time. <laughs> Years of experience, I guess. Hi. All right, there we go. So on my braille display, I'm actually reading hi. And then if I wanted to go back to my computer now, I can just hit the home key on the chameleon. And you guys won't hear this because I'm not sharing the screen, but I see Bluetooth. I can press enter and now I'm actually in my zoom window where I can see I'm actually got the leave button highlighted on my screen. So uh, I'm not going to, I'm not ready to leave yet. So we're going to navigate away from there, but that just kind of shows you a quick demo of how easy and friendly this is to navigate in between devices and use them quickly and responsibly. Uh, and so pre COVID, one thing I was telling Greg, I always like to kind of just talk about this is, on the bus, um, I don't really like to have my iPhone out um, in, in public. I just, it's one of those things I'm, I'm a little nervous about. Um, so one of the things I like to do is, is lock the screen, put it in my bag, and I can have my chameleon on my lap and I can navigate on the chameleon in local mode and read Bookshare or NFB books. Uh, so Bookshare books or NFB Newsline, or I can actually you know, go on and look at anything on my iPhone with it in my bag. So that actually just makes me feel a little safer. Um, so to kind of wrap this up and sort of transition over to our next guest, what I wanna talk about is how we sort of go through and evaluate the software. So Andrew at the beginning talked about the, the meeting that we had where we had all the teachers in and we got their feedback. So I do quality assurance. So what we did is I, there we go. I take the uh, feedback that we get, put it in a system, and we take uh, all of the suggestions and we go to humanware and we, we write specs. So um, basically what happened is we got the chameleon. Uh, I believe we had that meeting in December. We were doing what's called field test and expert review in April. So it just kind of shows you how quickly times and things move. So um, what, what was great is we, we had already done at APH a 20 cell braille display. So normally what happens is you do field testing, which basically means it's a product that, that, that has never been done by APH or is, is a brand new idea. We have to then submit that out to teachers, TBIs, uh, to students, to different organizations, and we get their feedback on any of the 
problems or just features that they would want to add? Does this meet their needs, so to speak? So uh, with the chameleon though, because we've already, already had addressed the need on a previous uh, product that we had, we knew there was a need. We had a survey that we sent out. We knew that the field still wanted a 20 cell. So what we did is we actually with the committee did an expert review. So in the APH newsletter, uh, I wrote up a document that basically just asked for expert reviewers. It went out and we got over 40 submissions back that I had to wade through and kind of go, okay, this person looks good. This person looks good. Everybody we got actually looked good. It was just more of narrowing down, uh, you know, kind of some diversity in do you use Android, do you use iPhone, do you use Mac, Windows, et cetera. Uh, so with us here today, we have Stephen Guerra, and he was one of the six reviewers that was selected to review the chameleon. Uh, Stephen, you had it for, I believe, around two months. Um, and within that review period, we did a few surveys, and we also did uh, kind of, you know, we had a few updates. We actually got to do the, do the update process over Wi-Fi. Um, and so that was, that was kind of a really good experience. I'd like to, Stephen, um, I'd like to kind of bring you on and to kind of talk about your experience. Um, so the morning. first question I have for you in a sense is, um, what do you think of the overall device, the chameleon itself? Good morning, Joe. Can you, everyone hear me okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. The device I thought was intuitive was exactly what maybe uh, at least students who I teach uh, were needing um, because it, to have a, a display larger than 20 cells sometimes can be a little bulky and a little cumbersome and doesn't allow for the situation for them to operate with something that they could use without having it stick out like a sore thumb. So a 20 cell display was a perfect size and the chameleon in itself is uh, as a great size and very easily can fit into a, 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 a smaller backpack or even a purse for a lady. Um, and it works out nicely. And with the multiple Bluetooth capabilities and enables them to switch between the computer and, and their mobile device on the fly very quickly. Awesome. And, and so I know me and Steven, we addressed, we, we exchanged several emails throughout the, the process. I know, um, you know, of course, when we, when we first give you the chameleon, it's sort of, it's, it's in beta process. So it's uh, going through changes. I know we had some issues getting connected to JAWS, but towards the end, um, when everything was working well, did you use it on multiple systems? Uh, how did you feel the, how did you feel the actual operating system was as far as like first letter navigation? Uh, did you, did you use it like any of the Bookshare and FB Newsline options on, on board? I did. And, um, uh, here, here I am, and most of the time with NFB Newsline, I've primarily used it with Braille devices, say, for instance. So it, under Finger, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to read the publications that you want to read when you want to read them. Uh, connecting it to multiple computers and or to an iPad or iPhone, it made it possible that I could have Braille when and how I wanted it and as quickly or as, as easily as I possibly could have it. Uh, it's a wonderful medium, Braille is a wonderful medium to have and to always use your voice or use the eloquence voice or whatever voice synthesizer you're using on your computer and or the voiceover for your iPhone or iPad, it, to see the things in Braille and using the chameleon as a Braille display was a wonderful addition to have have the opportunity to reinvent or reintroduce myself to Braille as I want it. Uh, so I found it to be a, a wonderful product and a product to certainly uh, be excited about for my students and or clients and uh, have them who, those who do use Braille to have the ability to have something as small and convenient as the chameleon and to continue to do and be a productive parts of society. Perfect. And I, one more question, and this is mainly also to just sort of educate the people that may be buyers out there. Um, I don't know that Greg touched on this, so I think it'd be good to ask. Um, I was looking back through your 
survey responses when we first uh, you know, sent out the survey. I don't remember your answer. I, I couldn't see that you put anything down, but I, did you ever use the editor and, for example, import a Word doc, like a docx file? Did you, did you ever do anything like that? I did. Um, I, as a volunteer, an, an officer for a volunteer organization, consumer organization for the blind, I have quite a few of those Word documents that I, that I have available that I have available to me. So I did import it and did have use it via the Word editor. So again, going back to previous documents like minutes of meetings that I take as a secretary of the organization, it allowed me to go back and see errors that may have been made with me just listening to the document versus in Braille. Like I said, Braille allows you the opportunity to see things that you may not hear very clearly. Sometimes the voice synthesizer, as wonderful as a product it may be, may not always be the end all. Seeing it in Braille allows you to really to uh, make those documents that you're making available for others who might be cited or not to really see the document with minimal or no errors or any issues in the document. Sometimes using doing it electronically with voice, sometimes things tend to get missed. So that's why we have collaborations with others. So um, importing the Word document or having the Word document available on the editor uh, allowed me to see things that I did not see before that I was able to correct and move on. Great, well, thank you again, Stephen, for partaking in the expert view and just providing all the feedback and making this a better product at the end of the day. Uh, we, we really do appreciate it. So, so thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Andrea. Uh, she's got uh, to kind of finish off the, the webinar here. Uh, and, and Andrea, when you're done, we then have tons of questions coming in for both you, Joe, and Greg to talk about the actual device. Um, but I want to hear uh, what Andrea has to say, and I am going to share my screen again. Andrea, would you like to introduce yourself again just so they know who you are? Super. Hello, Andrea Wallace. I am a TBI and O&M specialist. And if you weren't, if you missed the very first part of the webinar, I was a part of the uh, brainstorming session. Um, so thinking back to that, um, could you advance the slide, please, Leah? I'm sorry. I think there should be. Yes. Super. Thank you. Um, so thinking back to that kickoff meeting in May, and um, I think Joe said he was kind of painting the timeline for you, how quickly things move to get this device developed. And hats off to you guys. That's incredible. That was May 2019. And here you are um, putting this device out. I think that's magical. Um, so... I had a chance to get hands-on with the chameleon and now seeing uh, more of the demonstrations, I'm just, I'm over the moon with this device as a teacher and really excited to hopefully get it into students' hands very, very soon in Florida. Um, but you can tell of everything that Joe and Greg and, and Steven talked about, uh, you guys really took into consideration uh, the teacher input about what students needs and that need for refreshable braille. Uh, a device was truly developed for younger students um, I love that Stephen said it's Braille when and how he wanted it and our our students deserve that so it, it's just so so exciting so definitely the chameleon is a device to grow with uh, it's appropriate for young children for so many reasons because of its size its simplicity the number of Braille cells and they're as you could see the progression of this device that it has simple built-in features and then you can move on, add Wi-Fi, and access all kinds of um, material, all kinds of print. And then you can connect it to a more advanced device, a computer, a tablet, and um, really have a robust device in your hands. Uh, so that's something that's really, really beautiful. Um, and I, one thing too, as I was using it, the contextual menu, I think is just a beautiful built-in feature where if you don't know how to do something in a certain app, you can just pull up that menu lickety split and uh, figure out what to do. And I think that empowers our students to be more independent in using technology. 
uh, having the Wi-Fi makes it really easy to push firmware updates, which only means continual improvements for this device down the line. And I love that Greg mentioned earlier that there are so many concepts that can be taught for using a computer uh, when you're using the file manager. Those are so such important concepts that can you can start off with this device teach that concept and it transfers and generalizes over to using a computer, which is a beautiful thing. So this device is also a device to personalize. I'm so excited about the color cases and the stickers for students. I, uh, I can't wait to see the stickers. I can see the um, cases in the pictures, but not the stickers. Can't wait to check those out. I think students will love being able to personalize their device and it will make it more motivating to use. The device actually is super, super simple with its native environment. I love that the navigation is simple and consistent. Um, and for me as a TBI, once I learned that, um, that simple navigation, it's easier to um, teach and reinforce that with my students. There are multiple ways to complete tasks on this device, um, as you could see from the demonstrations today, uh, from using shortcut keys essentially on the device or cords, um, using the thumb letters for navigation, and accessing that contextual menu again. The editor app is super, super, super simple to save and edit files and open files and find them. Um, and I love that you could incorporate Braille instruction on this device as well in conjunction with a traditional reading program. Um, so it's a great supplement for Braille instruction. And using the SD card and thumb drive slots to provide more materials for your student is super easy. And I think especially during this time, that's going to be super important when we're trying to get materials to our students quickly and efficiently. Um, not only is it simple, but it's also super robust. As you saw, you can go from using those built-in features to connecting to Wi-Fi, to access BARD, to access NFB Newsline or Bookshare. And then you can go further and use Bluetooth and connect to your computer or tablet, check emails and do whatever you need to do to be productive and efficient. Um, but speaking of growing, um, as Greg showed earlier, there's the um, input for a headphone jack and volume control. So speech uh, coming along, that's super, super exciting. And the possibility of more apps um, in addition to the editor and the library app. So there's so much room to grow with this device and it, it's so exciting and it can grow and change just like a chameleon uh, to meet students' needs. So uh, great job on this device. I'm really excited to get it um, out there to Florida students, which is on our next slide. So Florida's plan to uh, launch the Chameleon, we do have a ever-growing loan library uh, where we have lots of um, materials and also assistive technology devices that we can loan out to Florida teachers so that they can collect data and assess students on what devices will work best for them. So we're really excited to add the Chameleon to the loan library. And at that price point uh, that was mentioned earlier, we're hoping that we can actually add quite a few. Um, I like to call this kind of like a braille note taker light. Um, it, it meets in the middle of both worlds. It's, it's more robust than just a refreshable braille display. Um, and it has the ability to be as robust as a note taker, but it just has to have a, a, that additional device to connect with. So um, I'm hoping with that price point, we can have quite a few. Um, we also provide professional development and what we plan on doing to help with the launch of the Chameleon is we are, pro we are developing modules right now on teaching refreshable Braille displays and that will include uh, the Chameleon and some features of the Chameleon. So it will definitely uh, be showcased uh, in those modules and hopefully develop some task analysis and lesson, task analysis, uh, and lesson plans for teachers um, so that they can be comfortable teaching these devices and especially from a distance. We also do loan devices for learning. So if teachers need a device um, to help supplement their, to help create their lesson plans and teach their students at a distance, we do offer loan devices for that as well. Um, family caregiver support, we do have our Florida Festival of Families where we um, provide uh, um, vendors and lots of resources for parents and families so that they can learn about this assistive technology their students uh, should be learning about. And they can ask questions and meet adults with visual impairments so they can have their eye on the prize of the future. 
Um, but teachers are now connecting with families more than ever due to COVID-19 and really involving them in the education of, of their students and their children. It's, it's, it's incredible to see now um, how families can help facilitate the learning of assistive technology devices and um, all kinds of things that they need to learn. So family involvement is really, really important if, when it's possible. So just remember that that is an, I, an IDEA when it talks about assistive technology services that anybody who's involved in the education of a student with visual impairment uh, should learn about that assistive technology device that they are learning. Um, so thank you again for having me. It's so exciting to be a part of this launch. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Andrea, for all of that extra insight. I have learned so much just from listening. And I'm also going to continue learning because there's a lot of questions that have mounted. And if I can, I'd like to be able to go and look through some of those and see if we can feel through them together, if that's good. And these are really not in any specific order, but because a few of these came um, up towards the end, there were some um, information that was given about stickers. So I wanted to, I wanted to at least start with that. It was fresh in my mind. And the question is, are the stickers easy to be removed if the device is given to another student later on? So Joe, you, you were involved in the QC of this. Did you, did you put the stickers on? I personally have not put them on or taken them off. I know they're tactile stickers. So I, I think yeah, you can get so your fingernail under them. Yeah, so, so basically, I don't know, how, you probably can't see this very well on, on the slides that we have, but they do have like tactile marks on the front and it's, it's very simple to kind of get your finger underneath them. It also, the fact that, um, I'm just picturing, I didn't actually stick them on a case, but I did stick one on, a, on the box and I was able to remove it, but the case is gonna be a little bit slicker. Uh, so I would think that it would remove a little bit easier as well. And I didn't feel any residue left like when I when I lifted it up either. So that was good. Yeah, and we're we're aware that every state has different requirements uh, for state loan devices and, and things like that, right? So, you know, some states have no problem with students blinging them out and some students do it anyways. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, this is, it's, it's really dependent on the state and those stickers are in the box. It's up to you as the TVI if you want to give them to your teacher, your student or not. So it's totally totally their call. You can attach the stickers to the device or to the cases, to the, to the protective cases or the, the bumper cases that come on the colored cases as well. So it's really, it's totally up to you as the TVI, up to the student, however you want to use them. They're there if you want to use them. I think that's really important. I think that was good to share because there is concern oftentimes from the state level perspective and in, in the school level with um, being able to customize things for some stu students versus not. I wanted to go back to Andrea. You had, you know, we were talking about lesson plans and so there was a question, you know, everybody loves getting uh, additional resources. Will Florida be able to share their lessons with TVIs in other states? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> um, we plan on posting our modules on our very uh, specific Florida Canvas site. I don't see why not. We do have a resources page on our website, but don't go to it now because we're launching a new website at FIMCVI.org and that's going to happen over the weekend and the resources page will be much uh, friendlier to navigate. So um, once we get those developed, I do not see a problem. I'd have to talk with my team, but I don't see a problem sharing those on our resources page on the FIMC uh, website. That's great. That's one thing I love about our field is how we are so open to sharing um, information. So there are a lot of um, different technical assistance sort of questions. And we were talking about text-to-speech early on. Will the text-to-speech be an update that will be pushed out via updates? Um, how can people get access to it? Uh, it's a good question. So uh, let's talk about updates in general. So the first thing is that the updates, if you're connected to Wi-Fi, um, so if you've got your chameleon connected to Wi-Fi, those updates automatically come to your device in the same fashion that your phone gets updated or any other modern device. Um, it'll recognize that you're not running the most up-to-date version and say, hey, do you want to download this version? You say yes on your device and it just downloads it, uh, restarts your device and away you go. So yes, the software update would be um, that the text-to-speech would be included in that software update. And we're actually um, 
we we just launched the chameleon yesterday it started shipping and just like every other device that you buy on day one oftentimes there's an update right so we're we're currently working on a 1.01 version that uh we're we're very close to launching um and that would come uh that's not with the text-to-speech but that solves some some um inconsistencies and and some connectivity things and so we're always working to make sure that the the software is as up to date as possible and that can come either over wi-fi or if you don't have your device connected to wi-fi you'll be able to go on our website download the update file throw it on the thumb drive and just pop the thumb drive into the device and update mm -hmm. that way as well Okay, here's a, a question that, that would need some specific explaining, if you will, um, about explaining the steps to connect uh, to the computer via USB. Is there any demonstration that might be able to be provided? So, yeah, so through USB, actually, it's, it's, um, it's very simple. Uh, it, it's actually one of my preferred ways. Uh, so I, I don't know that I could really if I share my screen, it probably won't do a lot of justice, but. Um, so one of the things, Joe, it, it, once you explain it, I'm going to let people know that we will continue to have chameleon trainings. Do not okay. think this was a one and done type of thing. Uh, this is the beginning and so, we can see that perfect. Okay, cool. Yeah. So basically all you have to do is plug this USB-C end into the device. On my computer, it does make a noise. I guess I could have demonstrated that, uh, but it just lets you know that it was connected. Um, so then I'm, I'm back on the editor, so I can just hit the right thumb key or the space or T for terminal. Terminal is actually the next one down from editor. So I go to terminal, I press enter. The first option that comes up says USB connection. You just press enter on that and it will say braille display. Now what will have to happen is I'm paired to JAWS right now uh, through Bluetooth, I would just have to restart JAWS and it would actually move over to the USB side. Um, so, and if like NVDA, if you just start, NVDA usually will auto detect when you change, but if not, you just restart NVDA and you are now using USB-C uh, uh, to your computer to read the Braille display. And at the time that, um school starts whenever <laughs> whenever that is uh we expect that the most updated version of this will be included in jaws 2020 uh it, we're expecting that to be uh, the driver to be included in the july update of jaws 2020 if you're not running that latest update when school starts or if your student is not on our website if you go to aph.org chameleon or our other device aph.org mantis um, there is a JAWS driver that's available right on that. You just download that driver, install it, and it uh, adds the Mantis or the Chameleon to your JAWS um, installation. So whether or not you're using the most updated version, that option is there as well. And that's only for JAWS. Uh, if you're using NVDA or any of the Apple devices, uh, there is no additional driver necessary. Thank you. There is a... a very valuable question. Do you anticipate any difficulties connecting to school district networks? For example, Orbit readers did not connect well with school networks. Is there anyone that might be able to shed a little light on that? So I'll be, I'll be honest with you. This, this is not a device that's gonna be used for web browsing, right? This is, I think, I think Andrea said it beautifully. This is a note taker light, right? And when it comes to the web, it's pretty light in that regard. So the purpose of web browser or the purpose of connecting to the Wi-Fi, is strictly if they're gonna download books directly to the device or if they're gonna update the tool over Wi-Fi. And that's, that's really, you don't have to have it connected every day to do that, right? So. Um, the reality is on a day-to-day -day basis, unless they're downloading books every single day, the need to have connectivity to Wi-Fi every day is not, is not essential, right? Um, so um, whether they're downloading books at home or whether they have a special network at school that uses a WPA password or a traditional, you know, the, the, the same type of thing that you have at home, right? When you're at home, you type in a password to connect to your, to your network. You don't go to a special authentication website and and authenticate that way with your student ID and things like that and that this these are not new challenges that we've faced in the field um, due to the the requirements of these devices and things so 
um, if, you're, if your device or if your, your school does have uh, a network that allows you to type in a password to connect to it, it'll work immediately, right? But if you're using an, auth an authentication uh, network, um, then we, it, it will not connect. And the reason being is because we don't have a web browser built into the device. And that's, that's you know, I, I've seen comments about making sure that we keep costs low. That, that's one of the highest development, I would say, costs. And, and the reason why devices like, you know, advanced note takers and things like that are much more expensive is because there's a lot of effort and development that has to go into a device to make a non-visual web browser, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen a couple other subsequent things regarding passwords. Um, do you use computer braille for, for passwords? I believe you can use now in the most recent update that we have, Joe, check my math on this, but I think you can use your preferred grade of braille now if you're using Yes, it. which which was a welcome change. I, I, yeah. So yeah, it, it depends whichever you, so you can hit, uh, you can choose which, uh, if you're gonna use contracted or uncontracted or computer braille, whichever you have it set to will be what you type in the password field. Correct. There is a question about editor, if we could uh, mm -hmm. switch gears to editor. Um, does the editor have the same options for proof reading, like a word processor, such as copy, paste, insert, that sort of thing? Joe, you want to touch on that? Yeah. Uh, so the editor is, is, a, is a basic editor, but yes. Yeah, so um, one feature that Andrea brought up that I really actually wanted to highlight here is what's called the context menu. So on the chameleon, if you hit space with M at any point, you can actually see a context menu pop up. And that will actually give you helpful um, suggestions of what you can do in that particular time. So if you're ever lost and you're kind of like, oh man, I don't remember how to copy. So for example, I'm in the editor now. So I would hit space with M and then that says file. I can hit the thumb key that says edit. I can just press enter or a cursor routing key, uh, enters dot eight. Um, so then I have find and it has, for example, space with F. So that tells me that's the, the command I would do to, to do find. So I'm gonna just kind of arrow down through here. So I have find, I have replace, I have copy, which is actually backspace with Y. And then there's cut, paste, select text, and then select all and then you have close so that you can back out of that. So you can do things like cut from one file to another. You can um, obviously, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no like advanced features like spell checking or anything like that. But as far as you can sort of move text from one file to another, or if you're reading a book, you can copy that text and bring it in to your editor to, to manipulate it into your text if you'd like. And I think that the, the real value when you look at the, um, the context menu is it's very similar to, to a computer in that when you would go to the menu bar on a computer. So if you go to the menu bar, you go to the file menu, uh, and I'm thinking of, you know, old school office, right? Now they've got ribbons and sub ribbons and all that other fun stuff. But when you look at the way that the menu bar used to be, you would go to the file menu and you would see save, right? And right next to save, it would say control S. So you could remember the next time that you went to, that you needed to save a document, you could press control S. In the same fashion here, when you go to the context menu, you can find out that cut is space plus V, or sorry, space plus X to cut and paste is space plus V. So that your student, the next time that they need to do this, they, they can find and they can memorize their own keyboard shortcuts from that context menu. So you don't always have to have that manual sitting right next to you. It's right there in the context menu so that when your student asks you, hey, how do I do this command? You can say, well, go to the context menu. You find it. So one other quick thing, just to mention, we were kind of touching on it on the last question, but then kind of moved into this question as well, is with translation. So let's say you're working with a really young student and they know a lot of grade one and a little bit of grade two. One of the nice things about this display is you can just do a backspace, so dot seven with space and G, and that will actually change your input from input, or sorry, uncontracted to contracted to computer on the fly and it will actually change. So if I, I actually just move mine from contracted to uncontracted. So now if I type in something, it's going to be in, in grade one. So that's really nice for a young student that may uh, not know the whole code and you're kind of sort of teaching them little by little as, as you go. So 
I, I love that, that sort of translation on the fly that this has. Um, and, and speaking of translation, uh, just to, to comment there, so the Braille output is translated as you want. So you have uncontracted, as Joe said, if the student doesn't know the A-N-D symbol and it's written there and they're like, what is that? They can press the command to toggle uh, contracted to uncontracted and it'll expand the AND symbol to the A-N-D uh, on the display. But the really cool piece as well is that there's built-in translation so that when the student is done writing their document, they could write that in their preferred grade of Braille. And we support um, tons of Braille codes, tons of languages. If you have a student who's reading a Spanish document, for example, and they want to read it in Spanish Braille, they can change their Braille output to be Spanish Braille. Um, same with their, their Braille input. So the cool thing with this is that the contractions, if they're writing in contracted Braille, if they take that file and they put it onto a thumb drive or an SD card and they give it to you, it's written when you open it as a text file, you're seeing it in perfectly looking print at that point. So the translation is happening on the fly as it, as it does in many of the Braille note takers today. I saw two connection questions. One was, does it connect to Chromebook? And the other, does it connect to Mac Connect? Which is so, Android. Yeah, so, so there's, there's two things. So Google, uh, I'm going to put the ownership on Google here. <laughs> so we've done our part. Um, Google needs to put it into a future update of their Braille back uh, software because Google uh, separates Braille and speech and many of their things. Um, they, they, uh, <laughs> so I'm say preach. They, there is a, there is a, the separation of speech and Braille in Google. And so they do need to update Braille back uh, to include our, Mantis and Chameleon devices. Um, one thing that Joe didn't didn't show, and I think it's one of the cooler things that we've done in in the the modern device connections now that we're doing, is traditionally when you're connecting to iOS, I'll use iOS as an example. You have to go into accessibility, Voiceover, Braille, and then find your Braille display there. The really cool thing with the way that we're using these new devices is we're using a, a different style of connection. And the nice thing is, is that now when you connect the Mantis or the Chameleon to your iOS devices or your Mac or your PC, you do it through the traditional Bluetooth setup. The same way that you pair a Bluetooth keyboard or the same way that you pair your Bluetooth headphones, uh, you pair the Chameleon or the Mantis now. So you go to your settings, you go to Bluetooth, you find it just like you'd find any other device and you pair it that way. Um, and yeah, <laughs> great, Laurie. I'm glad that makes you happy. Um, so at this point, it's done. You don't have to memorize a special way to pair your Braille displays. You pair it the same way that you teach your kid to pair a Bluetooth keyboard or their headphones. Uh, going back to the Google question. So it is our hope that, that they do that prior to the school starting. But unfortunately, uh, this is where... Greg and the rest of the team just throw up our hands and say it's out of our control now. <laughs> definitely, definitely. One of the things I would like to say, um, this is Leanne again, you saw in the very beginning of this presentation the main menu components. And again, this is a kickoff. These are the beginning. So realize future trainings will come for smaller groups of those components and how to utilize those components, as well as reaching out to teachers and, and people who are using it. So Andrea and, and um, Oh, uh, Steve, thank you. I mean, that, those, that information from the field is what is so beneficial, and we want to make sure that we are um, working with all of you to get information out. Uh, we do share well in this field. That's probably a bonus in our field, as we share very well. And so to continue to share. If you are looking for a specific type of training, that's something you tell us. We try to meet your needs, but unless you talk to us and tell us what you need, we're not always sure what you need. So please let us know. One of the, the bits of feedback in, uh, in my previous career, I worked 12 years at HumanWare. One of the things we did was we, we really focused on those quick um, tutorial videos. I see they're still using them over there at HumanWare. And HumanWare is actually behind the partnership or the human was behind this, this, this product on the, the development side. This is a collaborative product between APH and humanware. APH, you're going to see a lot of products like this uh, where we work with um, vendors and we work with um, 
AT partners in the in the field because that's that's how we create the best products for you um, that are available from APH is, is through partnerships. APH and the relationship that we have with the the, the field and and you all and, and and this is an example of that with the way that we worked with Andrea and the rest of the team. Um, to understand the needs is is really how we serve you best. And so when you see products like this in partnership with AT companies and mainstream companies and things like that, it ensures that you're getting the best possible product. And so um, when I when I look at what um, Humanware is doing with their their you know uh, tutorial videos and stuff like that, it's and the feedback that we've gotten on those type of videos, our hope is to be putting out when Chameleon when the school starts that we'll have some quick tip videos. Um, to show you individual features or individual tasks, really task-based um, things that, that we're going to be doing. We've started creating a few of those for Mantis, and uh, our hope is to do the same for Chameleon. So you can check out our YouTube channel or down the road, potentially uh, it will, we'll, we'll have those up on our own uh, site as well. This Amy, is Andrea. Oh, oh go sorry. for it. No, go for it, Andrea. <laughs> I was just going to say, I really love the support that APH is putting out for teachers and all these new professional development opportunities. It's it's critical. And, and thank you for all the work you guys are um, doing to make that happen. Um, it makes our job, too, from the professional development standpoint at FIMC, we're a very small crew. So to be able to add to the library, like you said, our field is very good at sharing. This is just beautiful. So thank you. We look forward to chameleon uh, trainings and webinars. In a shameless plug, we are going to be doing a webinar where we're moving and showing you how to copy and paste books onto the device, as well as sort of going through that Bookshare NFB Newsline menu as well. So, I think that's great to close on. I'm glad that you circled back to, or you didn't circle back, you circled back in my mind. Um, you didn't even know that, that there were questions that were put in there about wanting to see more demos of Bookshare and being used with the device. So that just feeds into of just knowing how much more will be forthcoming of those how-to um, instances. So thank you. Uh, I'm gonna ask one final question that I saw come in real quickly is, was there spell checker with the device? There the is note taker? Nope. There's not. Nope. Nope. Okay, excellent opportunity to learn to connect to a device that has spell check. Okay, Amy, were there any other questions that you saw coming in? Leanne? Oh, yes, go for Steve, it. Steve, I just want to say if, if the individual, for the simple simplicity of it, if the individual is connected to an iOS device and they're doing the, um, they take their document and maybe uh, get it somehow over to their iPhone, then when opening the document on your iPhone or iPad, there is that spell check that's automatically as part of the document. Oh, thank you. Good to know. Good to know. While I am not going to hold everyone any longer, I want to say thank you very much to all of you for participating and uh, giving that beginning introduction. And we meant it. It's an introduction to Chameleon. Um, while it has simplicity, it is a powerful device in and of itself. So we'll continue to build your knowledge so that you're building your students and clients knowledge. So I just wanted to let you that know that and, and then again, thank you all of you for providing this webinar to everyone.